Good morning, everyone. We uh, welcome you here today as we gather to worship. It's a beautiful day outside, and we're hoping it turns out pretty good inside. So uh, thanks for being here. The uh, women had a very uh, active day yesterday with the uh, PW Fall Sale, and uh, there are a few items left in the entryway from that if you would uh, like to pick those up. We are meeting for the next couple weeks yet in here instead of the sanctuary. But as I say that, I also want to make you aware, if you're one of the people who has uh, signed up to help us unload the seats when they come, in theory, they're coming on Tuesday. We do have a call list uh, filled out and you will get a call when we know more. But in theory, they are, some of them, it's supposed to be two shipments, some of them are due to be here this Tuesday. And of course, we'd appreciate any help available as we uh, unload those. Um, we do have a, a number of people who are still uh, dealing with some pretty serious health issues, and a couple of those are still COVID-related, and we want to keep uh, all such people in our prayers and uh, make time to call or, or visit as is appropriate with that. One other uh, announcement, we've seen it happen again. Um, there, there are a number of scams going on. If you live at home and have a telephone, you know that. Your phone rings and people call to scam you. We have had several members of the church um, where an attempt was made to scam them saying that it was either me or someone representing me calling on behalf of the church. Uh, we don't do that. We do not do that. So if somebody calls with that, in, with that line of reasoning, um, we just don't do that. Uh, and we have had a couple of cases where someone was trying to convey money to us in response to the scam, but we caught it before it happened because they, they thought enough to call me directly or call the church and have it confirmed that we're not doing that. So just uh, unless you know the person involved specifically and, and they can help you to know that it, that it is who indeed they say they are, please do not do that. Uh, law enforcement is aware of this happening uh, around our nation, definitely around our community. Uh, but please, if somebody's calling, if you did not originate the call, you don't want to have anything to do with it. So please bear that in mind. Almighty God, every morning we wake up and we are surprised by some new beauty or grace. Some days it's start rolling storm clouds. Some days it's sunshine. Some days it's a, a sky alive with color. Some days it's something else. But, but Lord, in your mercy, you bless us every day. And we come to you today as people filled with gratitude. As we sit in proximity to one another, as we experience what it means to be a community and to care for one another, fill our hearts with praise. Clear distractions from our minds and help us for this time to focus on you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please join together with me in the response of call to worship? It is printed in your bulletins and projected on the screen. Come, all who are anxious and burdened, this is a time to experience good news. This is God's house, and we can meet God here. We are brought together in the family of God. Come with expectancy and anticipation. God is present to greet you and change your life. We are here to remember the ministry of Jesus. We have come to be equipped for our ministry. In our eager waiting, there is fullness of joy. In our preparation for worship, we discover life. Unless God is the shaper of our lives, we live in vain. Unless we view our city as God's home, there is emptiness here. Our opening hymn is on the screens and printed in the bulletins, God is here. Please stand and sing.
hymn says here in honesty of preaching, the idea that, that God's word isn't always honestly handled. And, and honesty is an incredibly important part of the faith. No matter what our greatest flaw is, God seems willing to receive us as long as we are honest about who we are. Honest about what we struggle with. Honest about what that which most often defeats us. We open our time of worship with a prayer of confession. We're not asking you to stand up in public and bear your soul, but we are asking you to stand before God and be honest about who you are, what you struggle with, and what needs God's attention most in your life. Please join together now with our unison prayer of confession. Most high God, we confess that we have not aspired to the best that we know. We have neither set our hope on Christ nor treated others with the love and respect we crave for ourselves. We seek to avoid entering into the depths of another's pain or risking our wealth out of compassion for all your saints. We do not want to embrace those we perceive as enemies or do good to those who hate us. We are afraid to trust the working of Christ's power among us. O oh God, help us to accept the demands of faith that we may experience its joy. Amen. Please take a moment now for silent and personal confession. Amen. If you dare to be honest about who you are, if you dare to be honest about your need, there's something you need to know. Before that ever happened, before you or I were born, actually thousands of years ago, God already accomplished your forgiveness. What we do here is really about our capability of accepting what God has already done. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. to honor 
and love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, as we seek to do that each day. We pray that you would look upon us with your favor, that you would lead us through life's trials, and that you would bless our efforts that others too might know of your riches. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Are there children here who would mind coming up and giving me a hand? There we go. I need to sit back here. I'm sorry, I need some of these things. How many of us are there? Wow, there's five. Thank you for coming. We have six of us. Wow. Um, could I have a volunteer, please? Okay, Everly. I'll remember that. I don't need you quite yet, but we'll, we will do that. First of all, well, I think we can do it. Would you give this to one of the other children just like as a sack? And would you give this to one of the other children as a sack? And would you give this to one of the other children as a sack? And maybe that one to one of the other children? And maybe that one to one of the other children? And maybe that one to everyone? Okay? All right, in the Bible today, we're going to read a story. It actually has two parts. In the one part, Jesus teaches about some, uh, well, basically, he's talking about elders in the church and pastors. So um, he's talking about a lot of us. But in the second part of the story, he tells a story about, well, it's not a story, it actually happened, about a woman who was described as a poor widow. Do you know what a widow is? Yes, ma'am. Right, a woman whose husband has died or passed away. That's exactly right. And um, at the time of Jesus, a woman who lost her husband, especially if she was from, from a smaller or poorer family, she was kind of on her own. She didn't have savings to live off of or anything else. And there weren't really a lot of jobs for single women. And so many of the widows tended to be very poor. They didn't have much money at all. Some did. Some from wealthier families did. But a lot of the widows, if they didn't have someone else in their family who loved them and welcomed them into their own home, they didn't have much of anything. Well, in this story that, that, that happens in our Bible lesson today, Jesus is at the temple, and they just collected the offering, just like we did here. And when people were coming in to make an offering, they some of them, especially some of them that were quite wealthy, they put a lot of money in the offering. Well, what do you have in your sacks? What's in there? Abby, what's in your sack? Money? Okay, in your sack? Coins. Coins? Quite a few? A little bit? Quite a lot? Is there more than $3 in there if you just take a quick look? Possibly. There's a lot of quarters in there. You girls? How about you? You got two pennies. Yeah. Um, kind of a bummer, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you see, that's something we have to remember. And, and we'll just use those widows at the time of Jesus as, as examples. They didn't choose to be that. Life kind of made it that way. Um, some people live a good, long, healthy life. And some people are married to people and they both live a good, long, healthy life. But sometimes in life, we pass away sooner than somebody else. And so it's just kind of like they didn't get sacks full of money just because we like them best. That's just what they got handed, right? And uh, it was just by chance that you got this sack. And, and uh, as Jesus tells the story, these other people come walking in and they put their money in the offering plate. Because they were using coins, it made a lot of noise. Those punks, they put a lot of money in there. And they were feeling pretty proud of themselves. And then this widow woman came along. And she put in that two pennies. And Jesus said, look at that. Look at that. She put in two pennies. 
And the disciples are going like, so what's the big deal? And he said, that's what she had. She didn't have a big sack full of money. Her sack is empty. Each of those guys, they could have been in one, two, three dollars, and they'd still have money left in their sack. Not her. She put in her, her last two pennies. And he thought her offering was bigger than all their offerings. Because she gave what she had, and she gave out of her heart, and she didn't hold back. And this is directly tied to the Bible lesson from last Sunday, where Jesus said the measure of our lives isn't how rich we are or how poor we are. It's how much we love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and if we love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. And that woman, in giving her two pennies, was giving money to be shared with other people who didn't have that much, who didn't even have two pennies. So that made her offering bigger than all of their offerings. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Jesus asks us, if we're going to follow him, to be generous from our hearts and to share not just money. Money is just a measure of something else. To share our time and our talent and our skills and sometimes our money. To share it generously with those who need it. Does that kind of make sense? And so all of a sudden, two pennies is as much as a sack full of money, or maybe even more. Because normally we think the more money you have, the richer you are, right? And he's saying it's not quite that way. Can you do an echo prayer with me? Let's do an echo prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Help us to know how to be generous with others. Amen. Thank you for coming up. It's good to see you all. You can go back to your seats. You want to take your sacks of money? You can take your sacks of money as long as you promise to tell me you're going to do something kind for others with it. Does that make sense? And Everly, because you only had two pennies, you get the other two sacks. Now remember, you got to do something kind for someone else with that. Got to tell you, every night, I empty my pocket into a big jar, and I emptied the jar for them. You know what? I might have given them the farm. I'm not sure. I, I should have thought that through. Uh, okay. So, today's gospel lesson starts in Mark 12. It's right after last week's lesson. And uh, it starts in Mark 12, beginning with the 38th verse. And shortly after I read this from Mark, I'm also going to be reading the same event from Matthew's Gospel, because they have a little different take on it, and I'll read that for you in a minute. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. They like to have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Then Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she has to live on. That ends our gospel for the moment. Last Sunday, we reviewed the ongoing conflict between Jesus 
and the large group of religious leaders in Jerusalem. We also described how that conflict came about. Jesus also had a very positive encounter, last week's lesson, with a teacher of the law, where together they agreed that the greatest of all the commandments that God has given is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. It's possible you could come away from last week's lesson believing that Jesus was discrediting the overall teaching of the religious leaders, but that is not the case. That's why I want to read from Matthew's version of that same story. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That means they are the highest authorities you have. They sit in Moses' seat so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. The structure that the law gives to society remains tremendously important for Jesus. Be careful to do everything they teach you. His lesson on the greatest commandment from last week is not intended to say that if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves, then anything else goes. If we can say we did something out of love, well, then it, it, it's a fine thing to do. That's not what he's saying. Jesus never seeks to do away with the wisdom and the order and the guidance that the law was intended to give us. The moral code, the ethical conduct, the self-discipline that the Old Testament laws call for are not being randomly cast aside here. When properly followed, the law brings decency and justice to our lives and to our society. This is why the law as a moral code even reaches into the most intimate of relationships to give our lives boundaries and direction that bring peace to our relationships and order to our society. What Jesus seeks to do is not eliminate the law, but to elevate our adherence to the law into something that elevates the well-being of all people. And to ensure that the mastery of the law, such as these religious leaders, had the ability to teach and practice, that that mastery of the law not be used to simply advance or promote one's own well-being. They had become very gifted at learning all the loopholes and all the nuances of the law, and to twist that so that they could benefit themselves. These religious leaders responsible for teaching and upholding the law the most have stooped to using that mastery of the law to take advantage of the very people they were responsible for caring about. The division rampant in our own culture today seems to center around people doing that same thing. Individuals or groups focus solely on their own perspective and either advancing or preserving some self-interest at the exclusion of any sense of greater good or any sense of a God who embodies a greater truth. We too, just, just like the poor woman in today's lesson, we too live in a world where people in positions of authority twist and skillfully manipulate laws and rules and policies to get the selfish outcomes they want. 
with no regard to God's greater sense of justice. Loving God with all that we are, loving our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves, that teaching put Jesus at odds with the leaders of Israel because that is what they were doing. They were taking advantage of their own abilities to take advantage of other people. Using their mastery of the rules and their privileged positions, especially the religious leadership, to, to advance themselves, to look out for their own self-interest. Jesus looks for a basic integrity between what we espouse and teach and what we do. The reality is, whether it's in his world then or our world now, whether it's in the secular world or in the religious world, the more wealth and privilege and authority under the law that we acquire, the more that we are in a position to work either for the better of others or to abuse that authority and advance ourselves at the expense of others. And we have all seen instances of that abuse of authority firsthand. Pastors and teachers who think the rules don't apply to them or their families. Bad cops. Employers who gladly pay employees as little as possible to increase their own bottom lines. Hospitals and medical institutions that position themselves to profit wildly from the misery of others. Leaders at every level who think that they are above the law and rules don't apply to them. A wealthy or influential few who feel that their privilege should allow them to shape policies to their own greatest benefit. I think of the many times that I've collided with colleagues who see nothing wrong with using their positions of privilege to skew processes to benefit themselves. Every one of us, I am sure, has seen this. If you've been in law enforcement or the clergy or almost any other profession, you cringe every time there's a new report of misconduct by someone in your same field. Because you know that even if you're striving your level best to honor God with how you live, the shame of someone else in your profession violating that code spills over onto you, and you hate that. In particular, Jesus teaches that the law must be used on behalf of those left most vulnerable by life. The law must be used most of all for the benefit of widows and orphans and vulnerable children and the impoverished and the simple-minded. Despite the church's many flaws, and the church has many flaws, but despite those flaws, followers of Jesus from every tradition throughout history have been involved in working for the welfare of groups in need. That's why hospitals and colleges and retirement homes and orphanages are, are so often founded and operated by Christian groups. Even locally, it's hard to be a long-term participant in this congregation or most any other congregation and not have given some support to water projects or food for kids or deacon holiday meals or scholarships or COVID-19 relief or rent assistance and utility assistance. The religious powers that Jesus confronts have lost sight of that obligation. to use their power and influence for the well-being of those most in need. In their efforts to feed their own vanity and acquire more power for themselves, they have ceased to even consider what it is God wants from them. What separates the temple authorities from the impoverished widow is the condition of their hearts. 
Clearly, even with her low social status and limited resources, she is much closer to loving God with her heart, soul, her mind, and strength, and much closer to loving her neighbor as herself. Much closer to these things than the assorted religious leaders butting heads with Jesus, because she is giving from the depth of who she is. So many of the wealthy of Jesus' day, and so many of the ultra-wealthy of our own day, and unfortunately, sometimes we ourselves, I mean, it's a two-edged sword, but so often, we give so much out of our own abundance, but we hold more back to, to make ease in our own lives. And especially as wealth grows larger and larger in the hands of a few, so many of those wealthy do charity only to buy name recognition and public approval for their endeavors. And oftentimes, to deflect attention from the more unsavory or unscrupulous behavior that they used to acquire their wealth in the first place. More than one influential foundation was built on the manipulative, guilty, and fearful conscience of a robber bear. This woman's two cents, according to Jesus, are worth far more than the millions of the wealthy big-name donors of either her day or our day. Because other than the mercy of God, she has no safety net. She trusts in that mercy more than she trusts in her own resources because she's had to trust in God's mercy for a very long time. And those who are giving out of their abundance, they still don't even know what that feels like. This story is built around money, yet it's not about money. Money is simply used here as a measure of a person's heart and a person's values, and a person's faith. Unlike the religious professionals, she clearly has more faith in God's kingdom than she has in what she can accumulate in this life. She derives her identity more by this opportunity for generosity than through her own personal financial situation. She finds more security investing in God's kingdom than by investing, by investing in her own worldly situation. As a young person growing up, I remember hearing sermons every fall about stewardship and the need for us to consider tithing 10% of our wealth, making a pledge to tithe 10% of our income in the upcoming year. I remember hearing those every year. As a pastor, I still recall the first time I came to the realization of how incomplete that message is. God doesn't want 10% of your income. God wants all of you. He wants each day. He wants your work, he wants your skills, he wants your relationships and your family and your energy. He wants all of you. Far more than our money, God wants our children and our grandchildren. As the ordination vows say, God wants our energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Yes, a pledge to tie the portion of your income for next year is a huge help to the church stewardship committee as they try to plan and make a budget. But it certainly isn't the extent of what God wants from us. He wants us to live lives in tune with his values. And he wants us to be courageous enough to practice his values in a world that doesn't respect his values very much at all. He doesn't see that very much in the religious leaders of his day. But he does find it in this impoverished woman 
whose small gift of money represents a life, a life lived in full response to his goodness. And I think that's what he wants from us. Not necessarily our last two cents, but lives oriented to him and his ways and his values. And you know as well as I do, that is as countercultural as it gets. Let us pray. Almighty God, we look around this room and we are surrounded by blessings. I find it amazing that we don't have our normal place of worship and yet we have a room that still holds us and we can worship in it. We have more than two times the space we need. That's your richness at work. We look around this space and we see people who care about us, who would do things to help us at a time of need without even us asking a word. That's your abundance at work. We're aware of the efforts of our church to feed hungry children or alleviate suffering in other places. And, and we're aware of that generosity and that's, that's your abundance at work. The women sold food and crafts yesterday and that money that's been earned from that will be used to, to help in all kinds of different situations and that's your abundance at work. We think about our homes. Most of us are not fearful of being cold this winter or having a safe place to lay our head tonight or having relationships where there's someone there that we can count on. And of course, our physical wealth is amazing. You've gifted most of us with skills and abilities that have allowed us to live comfortably, even long into our retirement. Your abundance is amazing. That doesn't even touch upon the natural beauty of this fall, or the moisture we'll get when the snow comes, or all of the other amazing things that go on in our natural world every day, every moment, and we aren't even there to see it. It's that amazing. We pray that you would awaken within us, especially for this month, that you would awaken within us an awareness of your richness and abundance, and that it would be an entire month of thanksgiving and gratitude for all that you have poured out upon us. We also ask for your wisdom and guidance for how we use those blessings, that we might not only revel in them for ourselves, but that we might use them to advance the work of your kingdom. We are mindful of people who are in darker periods of their lives. There are many who suffer with illness, many who are sick with COVID or recovering from injuries, who struggle each day with failing bodies, diminished eyesight, less ability to hear, isolation and loneliness, who have gotten so caught up in living that they've forgotten what it means to depend on you and then they turn around one day and they don't know how to find you. When people are lost and wounded and struggling, open our eyes to those situations and help us to share your richness into them. When people struggle with addictions or obsessions, give us wisdom for sharing your richness with them. When people struggle with mental illness or when people struggle with, with caregiving for someone who is very demanding, when people struggle with Alzheimer's, People struggle with other forms of dementia, and they aren't themselves. Of course, be with them and be with their caregivers because it's a challenging time. We pray for our nation's leaders, and we pray for their world's leaders, and those who aspire to be leaders, that they would read the words of Jesus and pause and think about what power and authority are meant to be about. 
that those who handle the law every day, be it through law enforcement, be it through the judicial system, be it through the court system, give wisdom and guidance and a sense of justice that comes from you as they seek to untangle the messes we make of our world and our lives. All of these things we pray in Christ's name and we remember now how he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In a moment, we are going to uh, share the sacrament of communion. If you are a visitor here today, as long as you recognize Christ as your Lord, you are more than welcome to share in that sacrament with us. Because we believe that people from every time and every place who have that allegiance to Christ are part of the same family and community. To remind ourselves of that as we prepare to receive the sacrament, Please join with me in stating the Apostles' Creed. It will be projected on, your, on the screen for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, He took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. When you gather like this, you do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Because I tell you, every time you eat the bread and every time you drink the cup, you show my presence with you until I come again. He was trying to assure them for a fearful time that lay ahead. And I'm always reminded when I, when I go to homes where people are dealing with life-ending circumstances and we share the sacrament, it seems to bring them such peace because they connect with Christ in that moment in a way that we do at no other time. The presence of Christ means that we experience the peace of Christ. We are still using the disposable cups and breads. If you would turn that with the juice side down and the bread side up, if you would remove the wafer or the foil covering, take that piece of bread in your hand. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. As you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. Please eat the wafer at this time.
of the joys and struggles of one another. It is as we support one another in difficult times, as we see that person who's a caregiver and we encourage them and support them because their task is very difficult. It's knowing that if we see someone along the road struggling, we're not afraid to stop and lend a hand. It's being unafraid to use what we have been gifted with on the behalf not just of ourselves, but of others. That's communion, and that's community. That's also hard to do sometimes, because we live in a broken and a fearful world. But if we hope to do that as we leave this place, we must take the resources of the faith with us. We must take with us the love of God, because frankly, our own love usually isn't enough to do it. We must take with us the grace that we experience most clearly in the person of Jesus Christ. We must take with us the hope and the joy and the fellowship and the encouragement and the actual support of our fellow believers that we find most of all coming through the Holy Spirit. If we know these gifts for ourselves, if we experience them in our own lives here and when we are alone, we also have the resources we need then to encounter other people and share with them as generously as God has shared with us. Go in peace.